So they think that they're worried about what could happen. No, you're worried about what you're worrying about. Now, if you just get that, it's just madness, right? Yeah. Like what's actually upsetting you and disturbing your mental, physiological and emotional peace is your own projections of a future that hasn't happened yet. Welcome to the Seamland podcast. My name is Seamland and today we talk with Peter Krohn. Peter is a writer, speaker, coach and human potential enthusiast. He works with athletes, entrepreneurs and organizations in overcoming mental barriers and achieving success. This episode is brought to you by BioOptimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough. Almost every person is deficient in magnesium because it's being depleted by stress. And on top of that, our foods are also much lower in magnesium because of soil depletion. BioOptimizer's has an amazing full-spectrum magnesium supplement called Magnesium Breakthrough. It includes seven of the most important magnesium types. Check out Magnesium Breakthrough at magbreakthrough.com forward slash seam and use the code seam10 for a 10% discount. Peter, welcome back to the show. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's good to see you. And uh, we yeah. ha- had like our podcast maybe like a year ago or something. But uh, you know, a little longer. Yeah, yeah. A, a little bit longer. But yeah, it's been quite of a hectic <laughs> year so far, and a lot of a uh, lot of events have happened. A lot of long things to like talk about. I'm I'm not sure what you're referring to, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, we're in the si- we're <laughs> in different simulation. <laughs> Yeah, you could say there's a, it's a slightly different planet we live on, but yeah, yeah, crazy times. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, how has it been for you? Like um, the, the, the difference between like LA is pretty big compared to like Estonia and like uh, Europe. So what have, what have like yeah. any, anything serious happened to you during this lockdown period or uh, how's it there? Um, nothing serious to me personally. I mean, it's certainly a trying time for everybody, you know, and within my, my area of expertise, I'm obviously getting a lot of questions and people reaching out for support. This is, uh, I would say far more challenging psychologically than it is physiologically. Right. I mean, I know people are scared of this boogeyman virus, but I think that for the most part, with all due respect is, um, is a complete decoy, you know, like you and I live in the world of health optimization and uh, true wellness. And we sadly live in a world that doesn't know what true health is, right? We live with systems that are focused on disease and sick management or sickness management. So um, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of struggle right now for people um, as a byproduct of this more so than the actual direct effect of any virus. Um, I'm just calling it sort of very revelatory, meaning it's revealing Mm. what dysfunction we have on the planet, the way that people abuse themselves, the way that people abuse each other, the way that people abuse our planet. So that to me is the gift of the virus is to show that as a, as a species, we're really pretty unevolved um and it's quite embarrassing honestly the absence of intelligence in the way that people treat themselves others and as i said our planet as a whole so and also these industries that are um inauthentic you know with being polite but like you look at the healthcare industry for example it's a misnomer because it's not a health care industry a doctor is a specialist in pathology and pharmacology that's what they study they don't study health. You and I, you know, I have a hyperbaric chamber in my house. You obviously are an expert in all things to do with, you know, sauna and sleep and uh, ice plunge and hormesis, you know, the, the, the stress that allows us to adapt into being a healthy version of ourselves where these industries want to just push and sell drugs. Now, I don't want to knock them. They save lives at the same time, but it's got nothing to do with health. So let's start to be accurate and say it's a sick care system or a disease management system because, it's, you know, it's just inaccurate to say that it's got anything to do with health. So, so I think the virus at one level is, as I said, a gift because we get to revisit all of these things that are happening on the planet that are um, a complete disservice to humanity. So my, you know, my focus, my passion has always been creating a new construct, creating a new world for people to live in where there is love, there is kindness, there is vitality, there is harmony. Um, That's, you know, the antithesis of the current state of affairs. So (laughs) nothing serious has happened to me, but, you know, it's just sad to see the millions of people's lives that have been absolutely devastated and ruined 
because of the choices of a select few who, you know, we could say are totally ignorant to what's actually going on, right? The virus yeah. isn't actually killing anyone. It's revealing people who are already sick and invariably on pharmacology, you know, products that are actually making them more susceptible. People who are on statins, ACE inhibitors, it's been shown that upregulates the ACE2 receptor on a cell, which is where the COVID binds. And then if you're particularly in a high polluted area, like, you know, the Wuhan's, the New York's, the, the LA's, like you're going to have those particular matters bind with the virus, go into the cell and then create the cascade of proteins that then lead to the hypoxia that's killing people. So is it really the virus or is it the fact that people are already sick? Right. Yes. So that's my take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you that, uh, it has been yeah. like pretty revelatory and a lot of things have been revealed, especially in regards to like these like pretty obvious fragilities, you know, like in the people's uh, personal health, as well as like, like we, we, we probably should have been aware of the potential of these kinds of things happening. Like uh, these uh, pandemics happen all the time on a, like a global, on like a grand scale in history and they happen yeah. pretty frequently. So we, why, why didn't we have like some sort of like, like we don't, we, you know, people practice fire drills, people practice like uh, yeah. gun drills or whatnot, but they don't practice uh, these kinds of thrills as a society and as a whole. So it's quite, quite in interesting to see that the, we, we like really, we kind of, we're living in this bubble almost that people expected this uh, modern society to protect them uh, against any, any, everything like nature itself. And, uh, but we kind of yeah. realize that this bubble is very fragile and there's actually this, uh, outside objective world that uh, isn't you know out there to take care of us so to say like the the if we if we were to be putting into ourselves in nature then we don't have like all these uh, protections uh, that would uh, shield us so we kind of re well, at, at least for me and I, I would hope that a, a lot of other people kind of snap themselves out of this bubble that uh, everything isn't supposed to be safe and we actually in this very deviant society where we are living it is very like bubble wrap as a side thing. Yeah, and I'd actually say that the bubble is that that barrier to Mother Nature is is actually what's creating our dis-ease, right? The more that we are out of harmony with Mother Nature, then the more that we're creating dysfunction. The second law of thermodynamics, this is just a principle of physics, will say that a system put in isolation increases entropy. Right. That's just that's the laws of physics. So when you, you you isolate something, it degenerates over time. What is the ultimate punishment for crime? You put someone in solitary confinement, you know, and if they're left there long enough, they start pulling out their nails and clawing their face because they are they're being literally separated from humanity, from their surroundings. And so what's happening now, as far as I'm concerned, is People are being locked down, they're being isolated from their livelihoods, from their family, from their loved ones, sometimes who are actually dying, and from Mother Nature itself, and it's creating degeneration. We actually have it completely the asinine wrong way around, which is we think that, oh, this virus is bad. No, humans are the virus. Right. Humans are disgusting in the way that they like push drugs that they slaughter animals in the most you know, hideous conditions. They ruin the planet by tearing down rainforests and you know, polluting our oceans and our airways. And then they think that it's a virus that's killing us? No, we, we as a whole are so sick just because of the way that mentally, physiologically, emotionally, we've, been, we've, we've completely destructed what it is to be a human who's in harmony with their surroundings. So that's why the virus to me is absolutely categorically the least thing to fear. What, what is scary is the fact that pharma, big pharma, which as I said, could arguably be way more responsible for deaths than a virus just by virtue of the fact that people are on these statins and ACE inhibitors, which of course is a byproduct of the fact that they've got cardiac disease, kidney issues, they've got the diabetic or they've got uh, high blood pressure, which we could say is the responsibility of the individual. But now that they're on these drugs, that that's actually making them way more susceptible, yet people think that pharmacology is the, the big savior with some BS vaccine. Like it's just complete insanity out there. Like nobody's yeah. actually using intelligence. So yeah. 
I get what you're saying. Yes, if I were to live in the woods, it'd be nice to have a shelter. You know, there's animals, but um, as it relates to our relationship to Mother Nature, we are completely clueless. We are literally poisoning ourselves. It's a sick planet. And therefore, if we live within the auspices of the planet, how can we thrive when we're actually creating our environment to be toxic? And that doesn't yeah. even talk to the agricultural industry, right? Like everything covered in glyphosate, which is a known carcinogen, which interrupts one of the most important pathways that creates an enzyme that would be dealing with uh, uh, an RNA DNA virus like this in terms of clipping it. But if those amino acids can't be created because people are eating GMO foods, which are not bio biologically available, covered in herbicides and pesticides, which are known to be toxic, and therefore they can't create good immunity, you've got this vicious cycle, which is fantastic for these big corporations making money, but it's got nothing to do with health. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, sad to see, and uh, it's a uh, pretty... I don't, I don't know like what's the solution would be like that uh, people a lot of people have like yes. res resorted to rioting and that sort of thing but uh, at the same time yeah it's uh yeah like uh, you can't really fight or you can but you know it's gonna be just cause more uh, distress and uh, chaos yeah it's devastating as somebody who really cares like i know you do this is why we connected and we have this incredible community of people who are committed to health it's uh it's, it is, it's very trying, it's very difficult because you'd like to believe that there are certain people within positions of authority that genuinely care, but it just doesn't look that way. You know, it's all about money. It's about cash. And this is why I love Ayurveda, part of my practice, right? We, we say that everything we talk about makes a lot of sense. It just doesn't make a lot of dollars. <laughs> and, um, yeah. you know, and so it, the most revered Ayurvedic doctor is the one that doesn't have any clients or patients in his waiting room because he's empowered and educated his community how to take care of themselves. Mm. Now you just get your head around that. It is such a beautiful system, but it flies in the face of trying to make money off people, right? Yeah. So if, if, you know, I shared yesterday, I was on a podcast, I said, if we were sitting in a pharma, uh, pharmaceutical like headquarters and they're getting their numbers for the first quarter and they're like oh my gosh like our drug sales are 50 percent they dropped they wouldn't be celebrating which would be a reflection of the fact that people don't need so many drugs because they're taking better care of themselves that would be a company that is dedicated to people's wellness no they want to sell more drugs they even have in in america i think there's only two or three countries around the world where you can literally brand yourself and advertise drugs that's how disgusting it is that they will pay actors to run through meadows and look all pretty you know with little puppies and children but it's really selling a drug right people used to think that drugs were something you get in a really sketchy part of town like at midnight or one o'clock in the morning from some dealer you know under like really like you know illegal situations or conditions no, now they just pump it through all of, you know, the TVs that are around uh, the States in the middle of your favorite TV shows. They're, they're the drug pushers now. You right. don't have to go down to like Skid Row and get drugs. It's, uh, it's, it's just bonkers. So yeah. it is devastating. And how do we change it? We, we, it's intelligence, you know? You gotta like educate people that just cause someone's in a white lab coat doesn't mean that they have your best interests at heart, nor do they know much about health. I mean, yeah. the, um, the food, interest, the food industry isn't interested in um, um, medicine and the medical industry isn't interested in food, you know? So they just do a vicious cycle, one feeding the other. People eat shitty food, they don't, you know, create health and then they need medicine. It's, it's a, as I said, yeah. great system for making money, but not as it relates to people's wellness. So yeah. there's, we got a long way to go and it is, uh, at times it's very um, disheartening and overwhelming. <laughs> yeah totally but uh you know at the same time i think like the the only thing that you can really do is to just you know educate yourself and uh get the right information yeah. and uh take care of yourself so uh you you, you yeah. if you are let's say if you are healthy and then you don't really have to resort to like the pharmaceuticals and uh that sort of thing so you, you know that's why that's why the first and most important thing is still to kind of keep yourself healthy uh, both physically and mentally and to kind of always yeah. keep yourself educated and up to date as well 
And that's what I'm trying to do, what I can, right? Like you and I are, we could say health experts, right? Like we are passionate and committed to what it means to be healthy. We look at things like sun exposure, you know, grounding, hydration, sleep quality, the, the types of food you eat, when you eat, intermittent fasting, doing detoxing through infrared saunas, cold plunge, you know, I have a hyperbaric chamber. Like there's a myriad of different methodologies now that are available to people. But as you said, either they don't have the knowledge or they don't have the resources, which is tough. Yet the government will spend billions to, you know, try and fast track a vaccine. It's just insanity. You know, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you clean up the food processes and our oceans and educate people as it relates to what it means to be truly healthy? That, that's what gets my goat is that that's the pretense of, oh, no, this is for your health and safety with all due respect, bullshit, it's not. You don't shut down mother nature, but leave a liquor store open and say, this is for your safety. What, right. what does that got to do with health, right? <laughs> so it is about the individual getting educated. I'm sure, you know, you like myself, I haven't touched pharmaceutical products for decades, you know? Now, that doesn't mean I'm special. It just means I'm fortunate that I've learned and educated myself. I've got discipline to take care of myself. Now, I also do want to give credit where credit is due, which is if you're in a triage situation, emergency situation, like if I was in a car accident, then I'll be the first to say, take me to the ER. Western medicine, that industry, fantastic at life-saving situations that are acute, right? So then doctors and nurses, beautiful. I'll be sending flowers and cards of thanks to all of them. But I don't want to be on a drug then for the rest of my life. People going to you know, their local pharmacy to continually refill something for their acid reflux or their constipation or their restless leg syndrome or whatever BS it is, that, that is a disservice and that is no longer a medicine. That's an addiction to a drug. A medicine is curative or preventative, right? So if you have to keep refilling something, then it's clearly not working. But people don't People are just bamboozled and completely hoodwinked by the fact that, oh, no, but my doctor said, so therefore it must be good for me. And, and so the whole system to me is, um, it's, it's pretty asinine. And as you said, it's up to people to get educated. That's where you and I are trying to do what we can to help people nudge the needle towards health optimization versus sickness management. And um, I think this virus is one of those great catalysts. You know, it might take a minute, but... I'm just going to keep doing whatever I can to inspire people to uh, take better care of themselves. Yeah, totally. And uh, let's talk about like the thing that you are specializing in, which is, you know, your mindset and psychology and control, you're like just being mindful. Yeah. So uh, how can you, let's say, deal? I, I, I would imagine like a lot of people have, uh, you know, asked you, how do you deal with the stressful times and how do you deal with this uh, maybe anxiety and uncertainty? Yeah. No, for sure. There's a lot of that right now. And I think uncertainty is probably the number one uh, topic of conversation. People just don't know what to do. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of my distinctions I teach that the very nature of life is uncertainty. Just like we could say that fire is hot. Well, then life is uncertain, yeah. right? That's its actual structure. It's always been uncertain. So we could say that prior to the virus, people were somewhat delusional that they had security. They had some sense of knowing what was going to happen just because you have the predictability of a job that you went to or a family that you had. Um, so that's illusory, right? And so I think this as well is it's helping people to have a greater sense of trust or if it's for some people faith, you know, because maybe their bent is more religious than spiritual. But for me, trust is what people are having to develop in this time where I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust that at a level that is sort of somewhat unconscious to me, that things are unfolding in accordance with life's bigger plan, because there is a there's an ultimate intelligence here at work. So I'm helping people to recognize one, you probably were always in a state of mild anxiety, you just had different mechanisms to deal with it, or you had the illusion of security. Whereas now you're actually getting to really look at can I be with the nature of life as it is uncertain and not get into some state of panic or fear? Because really, what is the common emotion right now is fear that people have. I, you know, I, arguably, it's focused mainly around the damn virus. This is why people are freaking out when someone's not wearing a mask here in America, which is just a joke, you know, because people have become so scared of the fact that there's this 
invisible boogie monster out there that you're going to get from a cardboard box from Amazon or, you know, because somebody's touched an apple at a grocery store. It's just, it's, it's insanity. So helping people just to relax, calm down, develop some emotional immunity, as well as physiological immunity, get educated, realize, well, hang on a minute, the virus really isn't killing many people relative to what's usually going on in the world, right? Iatrogenesis, which is medical errors, kills two to three times more people every year. Now, they don't track those yeah. numbers on TV, you know, because doctors, surgeons have fucked up or people following their actual prescription of drugs have had, you know, whatever led to their fatality. But that's, that's not including... Uh, overdoses or addictions, not yeah. recreational use of pharmacology products, right? That's, that's a whole nother kettle of, you know, problems with millions of people's lives affected. Um, so let's put it in perspective, like 99.7% of us, whatever, are going to be fine. And of that small percentage who sadly do pass, for which I have compassion for those families, even the CDC recognized that 94% of them had a comorbidities, uh, an average of 2.6 comorbidities. So you start to break down the numbers, it's just kind of crazy that people are freaking out over something that maybe 10, 11,000 people in the States have died solely from COVID itself. Now, if we were to really look at who they were, chances are maybe they were also on some kind of medication or they had a shitty diet and lifestyle. You know, there's going to be a few outliers that might, oh no, he was healthy and in his 40s and okay, great. But that's like one or five people, you know, relative to how many millions are dying every year from cancer, diabetes, you know, uh, cardiac disease uh, that they don't trace or track on TV for you because that makes good money treating those people. So, um, so I'm using perspective, you know, let's just not uh, freak out here. Um, education about how to be healthier so that you have an, a robust immune system. Um, and then also, I think, you know, it's a way to start to reevaluate what people are committed to in their own life. People are looking at their careers and going, well, maybe I don't want to be in this job. It's kind of been very right. stressful and I've just done it for a monthly paycheck. So people are getting to have a, um, an um, opportunity to reevaluate every area of their life. So I'm just supporting them that way. But I think the biggest thing is to recognize the fear and the predominant fear is of death and, uh, that is, that is a big one for people, but it's, um, I think death is one of the most beautiful conversations, ironically, because in order to stay alive, you have to continually die. The, the fear of death that people have is the death of themselves, the ego, but that is the ultimate form of liberation. When you get over your own fear of your own identity, mm -hmm. there is nothing more enlightening than that. So that's, uh, Again, a gift when people are ready to really look at the demise of their own persona and discover true freedom on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a frightening uh, like idea for a lot of people, but it is indeed uh, quite liberating, so to say. So, if you like, yeah. and I also want to kind of emphasize the point that um, you said the uncertainty is one of the most certain things like it's actually like one of the is it is like the only certain thing in the world or the universe that yeah. there is uncertainty <laughs> so yeah. isn't that beautiful yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, like I, I think a lot of people you know once they realize that they can also you know acknowledge that you know you can't control it because it is uncertain and uh, therefore like mm -hmm. you're being somewhat anxious and fearful of a thing that you can't control which is like counterproductive in a way you can't control the weather and you can't control you know these uh the situation so uh there's not nothing really you know uh beneficial or you're not gonna get anything out of it if you're worrying or if you are like fearful so i personally just feel like it's, it's much more to better to focus on the again like the other things that you can control yeah yeah it's an exercise in futility and, and as you said you're not going to get anything out of it other than what i would say you do get out of it is the byproducts of it right which is disease right yeah. if i that's what i love the word disease the absence of ease and the absence of ease it cascades through your emotional body into your physiological body where eventually it will manifest as disease so if you're in a state of stress as you know through the sympathetic nervous system if you're in a constant state of mild fight or flight or to severe fight or flight then 
your ability to actually repair and rejuvenate yourself, to sleep properly, to digest food properly, all of that is completely impaired, which means your body has to degenerate over time, which then is going to lead to sickness. So, so you don't get anything out of freaking out about life or trying to control it. But what you do get is the opposite of what everybody wants, which is you're creating a pathway to sickness. So the more that we can find peace with uncertainty, because as you said correctly, it is the only thing that is certain, then the more that you're going to be liberated and that then pushes us actually into parasympathetic because we're in a state of ease, which of course allows us to digest our food well, to um, not be in a state of urgency, to sleep better. And that actually is the pathway to vitality. So uh, again, it is a beautiful um, opportunity for people to wake up and recognize that even if they thought life was okay prior to this virus, they were probably already in a state of dis-ease at some level. And now this is sort of the ultimate sort of, um, you know, slap around the face with a two by four. And it's like, hey, you know, you might want to just reevaluate the way that you interact with your environment and the way that you perceive potential threats um, and uh, recognize this actually not very beneficial for you. Mm, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, and it hasn't been like that serious. So there hasn't been like a massive, massive, uh, no. I don't know, disaster. And there hasn't been like a nuclear warfare or something. So uh, we, a lot of people, no. like I would, I would say that uh, it was a, like a good reminder uh, before it got like really serious. And it's a yeah. yeah, like a second chance. A lot of people got <laughs> Orion. And I also like will think that in order to like maintain this sort of uh, like not being affected by these kinds of uh, uncertain events is to have like at least some, some this threshold of uh, like a psychological immunity. So because it, it all, all kind of starts from the mind and your psychology, because you are uh, even even before people are like physically coming into contact with any virus or with any event, they're psychologically being affected by it through like social media yes. and the news and other people. So they're already like yes. affected. They're infected uh, psychologically by the virus and they're like spreading it <laughs> in a way yeah. by weakening their own immune system and kind of jeopardizing uh, their immunity towards it. So they may potentially spread it physically as well in the future more easily. So just having like this psychological immunity that you are able to let's say think for yourself a little more and you are able to make uh, more better decisions you're not going to immediately freak out on uh, the first thing yeah. uh, or the first news that you may come across and uh, yeah or even even if it, even if it is like serious then you're not gonna just lose your uh, like um, uh, serenity and calmness exactly 100 percent. and this is where the insanity is right the if if the nature of life is uncertain meaning we don't know what's going to happen in the future then when you really understand that there is nothing to freak out about because you don't know what people are freaking out about. And this is a bit that I want people to understand. And this is where my work has such a profound impact on my clients, especially my athletes who are performing at the highest level is the realm of the future is unknown. And yet the ego mind, which is by default looking to predict and protect because we want to survive the primordial pattern of any organism, right? Is to survive. So, it will then project, superimpose a potential worst case scenario in the future. So they think that they're worried about what could happen. No, you're worried about what you're worrying about. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you just get that, it's just madness, right? Yeah. Like what's actually upsetting you and disturbing your mental, physiological and emotional peace is your own projections of a future that hasn't happened yet. Mm. See, yeah. If I went up to whoever is freaking out about the virus and I said, oh, yes, I'm the world's greatest fortune teller. I've never been wrong. I'm 100 percent accurate. And I'm going to tell you that in your lifetime, you will never contract COVID. You will never be affected by a virus. The, immediately, they would feel a sense of huge relief. Now, yeah. what I'm presenting to them is as real as the future they're freaking out about. Why? Because neither of them have happened yet. <laughs> yeah. Right. So when people really understand that I'm presenting a future that has, quote unquote, we could say a positive outcome. What they're worried about is a future that has a negative outcome. The thing for people to really get here is they're both fictitious, but they are the precursor to a state of being that itself attracts circumstances and conditions based on how we're projecting an unforeseen future.
So if somebody's looking through the lens of worst case scenario, they're already experiencing the detrimental effects of that future before it's even happened. That's madness, right? Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. they wonder why they need to talk to a doctor, have more alcohol, smoke weed, or take medication, not realizing that the only thing that's actually upsetting them is their own imagination. So when you start to see that mechanism for what it is, which is, yes, it's all about survival and self-protection, but it is nonetheless self-generated. There is no future other than the one that you're predicting. And yeah. in that prediction, if there is a sense of, as I said, trust, or there is a sense of commitment to an extraordinary future, then who you're going to be in the moment is somebody who is resilient mentally, physically, who is uh, confident, who has a sense of calm and peace about them. If, however, you're using the mechanism in a different way, which is the future you're predicting, is it's worst case scenario and it's doom and gloom and you're going to die and blah, blah, blah. Well, then, I mean, you're already in that state <laughs> over something that may never happen, right? Yeah. I mean, as again, the, the numbers are ridiculous. The chances yeah. of somebody who's worried about COVID actually dying from COVID are so minute. So they may well contract it, go through months of fear, go through three or four days of symptoms and then be on the other side of it and go, oh, I was fine. Yeah, but you've actually created more damage from the months of concern than you did from the three days of actually contracting the virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so that if you are projecting this uh, worst case scenario, then you're kind of uh, like summoning yeah. or you're uh, creating it in real time because you're, let's say, you are, uh, first of all, the stress and anxiety will uh, weaken your immunity, but at the same time, you're also they, like, uh, you're going to engage in certain activities that kind of... Uh, you know, make it make it more likely to happen, like the worst case scenario. So yeah, it's a yeah, the, the mind course. is really weird in a way, and it applies to any other area of your life as well. Like maybe people are like maybe for for example, in terms of like public speaking or asking someone on a date or something, they're already projecting this <laughs> fearful worst case scenario into the future without it even yeah. happening, and then they're all like yeah, making it more likely to happen and making it just uh, real, just because of yeah. uh, this self self-fulfilling prophecy 100 percent, and that's how powerful the mind is that we start to recognize wow i'm generating i'm creating my own experience of life based on the projections which are automated so it's no one's fault right this is subconscious these are survival fight or flight mechanisms but as conscious beings as we evolve what we get to see is i get to override those i get to transcend those i get to see wow there's a part of me just by virtue of being human that is coming from a place of terror, from fear. But just like many of your listening you know, uh, audience, they probably have children. As a parent, when a child freaks out because they're scared, the parent doesn't freak out with them. The parent holds right. a space and goes, it's okay. They will hug them. They'll reassure them. They'll love them. So likewise with my work, it's doing the same thing, but within ourselves, is to notice the part of us that freaks out is no different than a scared child. And that we as an evolved, hopefully evolved human being adult, we get to go, oh, hang on a minute. There is a conversation and some imagery in my head about a future that hasn't happened yet based on pure fear. Is that true that that's gonna happen? And the answer will always be, I don't know because it hasn't happened. And in that, I don't know, there is so much freedom to be had if you can embrace that. Otherwise, as you said, it does become self-fulfilling, which is the part of us that is living from terror, from fear, from panic, is going to directly impact our emotional state and then consequently our physiological state. As you said, the actions that we make, people are going to cover themselves in sanitizer and all of this nonsense, which is now further compromising them because the chemicals that are going through their skin, that are affecting their hormonal states, that are weakening the immunity of whatever their their skin has as a natural tendency to engage with its environment and protect them chemist chemicals and alcohol have completely you know deteriorated that but that is a byproduct of the fact that they're scared they're wearing masks which is making them more disconnected from people they can't see through mirror neurons other people when we can't see other people's faces, we tend to go into more of a threatening situation because you don't see if someone's smiling or engaging. So it, it's, just, it's just a maddening cycle of one cascade into another where people are just getting 
uh, increasingly scared and as you said physiologically for that reason compromising themselves so it's mm. um it's disheartening it's sad you know i'm doing whatever i can to wake people up and go hello it's a virus you know right. we, we've got right. more viruses and bacteria in us than we do human dna yeah. you know love it embrace it like come on come on in there's plenty of room it's only for those people who are susceptible who don't take care of themselves fine let's protect them let's maybe help them to get in better shape let's get them off shitty gmo foods that are covered in glyphosate let's get them on better sleeping patterns let's get them moving and exercising not spending billions of dollars on a vaccine that's going to be even worse and have all sorts of horrendous side effects you know that's that's that is an asinine approach. You know, that yeah. is a very old way of trying to deal like with this germ theory, as right. opposed to no, let's inspire health so that whatever viruses come along, because let's face it, there's going to probably be more that we're okay with it. You know, otherwise what now, now adults are going to have a schedule like children of 72 vaccines, which is just <laughs> hideous. You know, yeah. it's just yeah. disgusting. Yeah. And the vaccine can also create this false sense of security, uh, or, or at the same time, it can also be uh, this positive self-fulfilling prophecy so that people uh, get vaccinated so they feel more secure that they are immune to the virus. Yes. And uh, then they may actually, you know, create this positive uh, hormones and positive state of mind that then yeah. protects them from the virus. But it's not necessarily the vaccine. It's again like the... <laughs> David, like the, the the beneficial more uh, more healthier state of mind and uh, yeah. state the state of physiology that actually kind of mediates a lot of the like immunity the the placebo effects right yeah, it's yeah. very powerful and i think you know if if <laughs> if they were to just inject people with saline so that they didn't have all of the terrible side effects which are bound to happen that they're seeing in all the studies you know people getting sorts of all sorts of horrific reactions to these tests, at least then we would mitigate and get rid of all the physiological damage that vaccines do, and maybe just rely on the placebo effect, as you said, where people are like, oh, they feel this full sense of security, but nonetheless, it does cascade into their body where they can relax, they start digesting their food properly, they build their immunity, and their OJAS is what we call in the Ayurveda, you know, which is that sense of vitality. So that would be an interesting experiment, but. Of course, they're not going to do that. There's, well, I was going to say there's too much liability, but that's the other red flag, right? These vaccine companies have zero liability. If that isn't a red yeah. flag, then I don't know what is. You know, if you and I open up a coffee shop and someone stubs their toe on a table, we're liable. But you can inject people <laughs> with poisons and you're not liable. I mean, if people don't see the insanity of that, I don't, <laughs> I don't know which bit they're not understanding. Yeah, that's a bit, <laughs> that's a bit of a weird thing and uh, yeah, something to be cautious of. Uh, but are there like any, are there like any more, let's say, immediate ways to relieve this stress and anxiety? Like any, any, any practices or any breathing practices or meditation or something that you do? For sure. I mean, I help people, especially with breathing, right? Like I think it's the predominant form of survival. You can go without food for weeks, maybe water for a, you know, ten days, a couple of weeks, be you know, a couple of minutes without your breath. <laughs> you're done so um i think for people to be able to tap into their breathing patterns as you know when we're in a fight or flight state our breathing tends to be very quick and very shallow and so we can get into this acidosis state versus when people can just slow down and take what i call lsd uh not the drug but long slow and deep breathing so uh i always remind people to make sure you get your dose of daily dose of lsd uh, <laughs> so just to sit quietly and do something like simple box breathing, you know, which is you breathe in for a count of four or five seconds, you hold for a count of four or five seconds, you breathe out for a count of four or five seconds, and then you hold for four or five seconds. So it sort of creates, that's why it's called box breathing, the four sides. Um, something as simple as like that, if you just did five counts of that, people, it's incredible how much more they would feel relaxed and the cascade into, as I said, their nervous system that then allows them to just nudge into parasympathetic, which is rest, rejuvenate, digest. So now all of a sudden they literally become physiologically, chemically a different human being. So that's a great practice. Um, in this time, you know, I really encourage people to get together, not isolate. You know, we thrive on community. We thrive on connection. Uh, I'm not saying be like irresponsible and go to a nursing home with very old people who are frail, but you know, within your family and friends, like hug, touch, you know, 
be together. Um, this isolation, as I said, based on the second law of thermodynamics is creating entropy and degeneration. And we're seeing it, right? There's actually, I would say, I can't quote the data, but like, as far as I'm concerned, there are way more people dying from suicide right now than there are from COVID. Um, and that is uh, devastating, you know, because yeah. of the psychological impacts of people being isolated, feeling overwhelmed and um, losing their livelihood. So the more we can come back together, create a community of like-minded people who genuinely care about each other, who aren't scared of the, the narratives from mainstream media, media that are just trying to propagate fear, then that's also gonna offset um, any of this anxiety that uh, is being created. Um, so that, you know, they're the simple exercises. And then the things that you talk a lot about, like sleep, um, getting good quality sleep, having a routine when it comes to your food and your feeding times, uh, eating good quality food. Uh, and I think more than anything right now, people are getting the opportunity to slow down. Uh, yeah. I think most people were burnt out anyway, <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, the, the excessive amount of pressure that people put on themselves to try and survive, to keep up with a job that maybe they're not really that, you know, uh, passionate about, uh, to, to keep up with the Joneses. And now actually they get to slow down and reevaluate what, what really is important to me in life. I'm certainly doing that. Hmm. I've cut out a few things in my life and, uh, just being grateful for the opportunity to be, to be human, to, uh, have the awareness that I have to not be freaking out about a virus that is part of mother nature. And that is actually, it's just a packet of information, right. That is revealing where we are a little bit, you know, off track as a, as a species. So I'm grateful for the education that life is giving us uh, and doing whatever I can to help people recognize, look, we, we're not going to survive if we keep treating ourselves, each other and the planet like this. So it's a, it's a beautiful wake up call. So yeah, breath work, better habits and a, a better um, perspective on what it means to be human. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. And the breathing is really, really critical because, yeah, your breath controls your nervous system and you can literally just freak out by, you know, starting to hyperventilate and uh, yeah. especially doing like mouth breathing. So uh, like a lot of people, you know, who tend to have, let's say, like uh, poor health uh, or even just poor habits, they tend to do like mouth breathing, which is uh, yeah. keeping their body in this constantly sympathetic state and they're stressed out uh, like this basally. Versus if you're doing it through, we're, we're like supposed to breathe through the no nose and uh, nasal breathing stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you are, you know, habitually just, you know, breathing through your mouth, <laughs> then uh, even when you're sleeping, then you are keeping your body in a stressed out state. So that's, that's really like a bad habit that people yeah. tend to have. And um, it, yeah. it does have like a huge impact on uh, sleep quality. And if your sleep is bad, then your like resiliency against stress, both physically and mentally is lower you're going to freak out much easier. And uh, yeah, it's like a vicious cycle. You're stressed out. Uh, you're going to have bad sleep because you have bad sleep. You're not recovered. And uh, you also then are easily more stressed out. You experience more stress and that stress makes it harder to sleep again. So it's a really bad yeah. uh, vicious cycle. Same with, as I said, when people are eating shitty food, right? Their body isn't able to actually generate good tissues. In Ayurveda, we recognize seven datus. So based on how the food gets broken down and then it goes into the equivalent of plasma and then blood and then muscle, and it goes through this cascade of how do we actually rejuvenate the body? Well, if you're eating shitty quality food because it's GMO or it's covered in glyphosates and all of these pesticides and toxic chemicals, or you're eating meat from slaughterhouses where the conditions are full of infections, the meat is injected with a ton of antibiotics, and the animals are completely traumatized. So they are also under stress. So their chemistry is adrenaline and cortisol. So you've got to understand that if you're putting quote unquote toxic food into your system and you're stressed, therefore you're not digesting it properly. Now you've got a double whammy of lose, lose, and then you can't actually create a vital physiology, which is your barrier to, you know, any kind of external threat, which, we would normally just deal with very readily like uh, there's as i said there's billions and billions of viruses out there that we get exposed to every day that don't don't bother us because we're in a state of harmony with our life and with our surroundings and we have a great sense of immunity so for sure for people to recognize that the cascade of 
anxiety, poor sleep, poor food, toxic environment, you, you're sort of set up for a bit of a disaster. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um, to be able to like, just at least be aware of that, go, wow, if I could start to make some better choices for myself and get, get out of this vicious cycle of stress that creates dis-ease, which then creates sickness or at least poor ability to rejuvenate myself, which itself leads to inability to deal with and therefore increased stress. Yes, it's a, uh, sadly, it's, a, it's the most common pattern that people are living in, right? It, it, that is the norm. So it's about shifting what it means to be human and making a new normal, not in the way that media want to say, oh, this is new normal. You've got to walk around with a mask and you've got to have a vaccine passport. No, that, that is just, that is, that's atrocious. That, that doesn't actually help anything because now we've actually made ourselves more compromised for the next virus that comes along versus educating people. No, let's become more robust. Let's become more vital, have a wholesome, you know, and a holistic view of what it means to be healthy. Um, then, you know, whatever virus comes along, it's like, we're going to handle. Yeah. 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 You, you mentioned that the vicious cycle. So, uh, that's also like another example of, uh, you, you mentioned the Newton's second law of thermodynamics earlier, but, uh, the vicious cycle yeah. is an example of the first law of thermodynamics that an object stays in motion uh, un unless it comes into contact with a, like an other, another opposing object. So it basically yeah. means that if you are on the trajectory of the bad habits and poor lifestyle, yeah. then it's much easier for you to stay on that track because you've gained so much like momentum uh, yeah. and it's harder to get off that track to get healthy because you're already in motion <laughs> unless something serious happens like unless something you get a disease you get cancer or heart disease or uh, yeah like some yeah. pandemic or something else that happens then you have like this trigger or like a wake-up call that you, okay i need to change something but on up, on up until that point most people just follow the same traje tra trajectory because they're in yeah. motion and the same applies to being yeah. healthy like if you're on the trajectory of being healthy then uh, momentum is on your side already and it's e easier to stay healthy because you already got the ball rolling and it's harder to actually yeah. get off the uh, wagon uh, because you yeah. kind of realize w what it feels like to be healthy and you don't really want to trade it for uh, anything else. No, it's beautifully said and it's why it takes somebody, you know, till they're 50, maybe 60 and they have a heart attack to actually revisit their diet and lifestyle, even though there were many milestones along the way where, you know, they've got on the scale and they're like, gosh, you know, their average weight was say 190 pounds and now they're 220 and it wasn't that bad and they were kind of tall. So you didn't really see the extra 30 pounds, but they didn't feel good in their body. You know, that's a primordial symptom. And then they were like next, you know, in a year they were 250 pounds and they just accumulated, which is the first stage of disease in Ayurveda, the six stages, which is so beautiful. And the first is accumulation. Hmm. And then they went to see their doctor and they said, oh, well, you've got high cholesterol. So now they put them on a statin, which they don't particularly like, but you know, they, they don't know any better. So they just keep taking the statin, which now has its, all of its side effects. And they're actually now, as you said, working towards that cardiac disease that then becomes a heart attack but they had many occasions, many opportunities to revisit their lifestyle. It took something traumatic, unfortunately, before they're like, wow, you know, maybe I should actually start to lose a bit of weight, exercise, move more, eat better quality food, maybe be more loving to my family or whatever it is, versus, you know, it, it taking that long for somebody to actually reinvent what it means to uh, be someone who's got a bit of self-care and self-love. And I think the virus is the societal equivalent of a heart attack where yeah. we're like, holy shit, we are just way off track right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, Completely. unfortunately, the momentum's pretty strong for the, you know, the 300 pound gorillas in the room who got billions and billions of dollars, whether it be these, you know, sort of apparent philanthropists who you know want to do whatever they want to do which is all bs or you've got like the big companies who don't want to upset their their shareholders and so they want to sell more like i understand it but it's completely um asinine as it relates to being a healthy society so yeah yeah we it's going to take a bit to uh to nudge that momentum in a different direction you know yeah yeah and uh, i also know that you uh, released like a course in the meanwhile about uh, freeing your mind so can you talk about it yes well? just trying to help people to uh, find some relief <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we actually, we released it just before COVID. It was funny timing. So people were so grateful and we actually, we shut it down because we just did a like 10 day launch. And then um, people kept saying, can you open it up again? So we, we had it open for a minute. And then uh, the last two months, we just did some incredible uh, upgrades where I just added a lot more content. So um, it's not open right now. You can sign up for the wait list. And depending on when this, uh, this conversation airs, I think it's going to be out middle of October with all of the upgrades. So that's been helping a lot of people just to understand the mechanisms of the mind how we create our own fear, which then, as we've just discussed, cascades into our own dis-ease. So to be able to at least have the awareness of those patterns and know how to uh, undo them and dissolve them, uh, it's been um, incredibly powerful. The feedback I've gotten is so, uh, it's so humbling, you know, how many people's lives have been traumatically uh, changed for the better. It's just uh, always so gratifying to hear that feedback. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. yeah. So that sounds good. Yeah, and I'm glad that a lot of people, because I think a lot of the, a lot of people just need some support or something to kind of uh, tell them, sure. uh, tell them uh, why they may feeling this way or why they may be feeling anxious or stressed out, which is perfectly normal. Uh, which is like the, that is like actually like a healthy response to a stressful event that you are creating these. Yeah. Uh, emotions and feelings but you just have to kind of also snap out of it sort of say that you and you yeah. just just people don't know that it's possible to do it so it is a perfect way of like saying to, that you free their mind you know like just letting yeah. them letting them out of this uh prison of anxiety and uh fear yeah absolutely and that's really what it is that to me is you know i, I use the expression most people go through life as prisoners of their own mind like constantly they think that it's their boss that upset them their spouse that annoyed them no i'm not saying that some of these behaviors are ideal i'm not condoning certain behaviors but we we are always creating either heaven on earth or hell on earth based on our perception and once you understand that then um, it's very empowering and it gives people at least the keys and the tools to understand, oh, wow, I have the choice once I'm aware, once I'm awake to decide whether I want to live in a state of fear or in a state of love and harmony. And it really is a choice. Most people are under the impression that that is the, the byproduct of circumstance, right? When my circumstances are the way I want them to be, including the people in my life, then I'll be okay, right? But if you really think about that, that is an exercise again in futility because that's exhausting. Where what I'm saying is I have to try and control everything, get it perfect so that I can find some reprieve, so that I can find a moment of peace. But you're never gonna get that because circumstance is always shifting, it's always changing. So my gift and the course, you know, freeing your mind is to be able to make you realize you have the ability to be totally at peace regardless of circumstance. Now that's a powerful person. That to me is yeah. true success. Cause I've got clients who literally have billions of dollars and they still struggle with anxiety or depression. They still have a far, you know, mild addiction. They don't know how to get along with their children or whatever it is that they're dealing with is the same thing that people are dealing with. They just have a lot of money. So that isn't the answer to freedom. Right. My product is real freedom regardless of circumstance. And uh, I can't think of anything better than that I get to share with uh, humans to help them find that sense of true inner peace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, is there any anything like you're doing in preparation of, you know, the coming a few months or something? Are you preparing for the second wave in some way? Or uh, yeah, how, how's it how's it like that end? For me personally, you mean? Yeah. No, I'm not worried in the slightest. I really, <laughs> the whole thing to me is completely bogus. You know, I'm not denying the presence of a, a virus, but there are literally, I think, listening, there's a doctor I love listening to, Zach Bush, who I don't know if you're familiar with, but uh, he says there's 10 to the 31 viruses on the planet. Like that's, you know, millions mm. and millions more stars that there are in the universe. So, you know, if you really start to put into perspective the fact that we are constantly surrounded by viruses and bacteria, so for me, I'm not, I'm not worried about a second wave at all. The only thing that could inspire a second wave is when people start taking the flu shot, which of course here in America, they are pushing like crazy, you know, because they probably know that that actually makes people a little bit more susceptible. I know that sounds like a very malicious intent, but unfortunately that's the world we live in. Um, so I would just stay away as best as possible from any kind of shots, from any kind of medication that obviously is uh, not 
you know, vital to your survival, you've got to talk to your own professional uh, medical healthcare providers, but, um, and just learn to become much more um, educated about how to take care of yourself. That's, that's my, I'm not worried in the slightest. If I get COVID, I'd be like, great. I got the latest update that whatever life is trying to give me. Right. Uh, it, it couldn't, couldn't, couldn't be less concerned about it. My only concern is the corruption, the oppression, the mandates that people want to force vaccines on people. That to me, that's scary. That is way more lethal than any virus as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's, it's a, it, like, it's not uh, the disease or the virus itself that is causing the most harm. It's like the humans themselves, <laughs> the governments and uh, the lockdowns and those crashing the economy yeah. and whatnot. And uh, that's, that's more actually causing more damage than uh, yeah, the disease. Millions, millions of people's lives affected. And again, every year, as I said, iatrogenesis. This is from the system that is apparently there to help you. Medical errors kills two to three times more people that have died from the virus. And that's every year, it's not seasonal. <laughs> yeah. You know, then there's millions who die from cardiac disease, cancer, diabetes, you know, but they don't do anything about that. Like, you know, meaning like they're not creating like a pandemic response, you know, stimulus packages. No way, this is crazy. Let's encourage people to get out to mother nature. Let's encourage people to exercise. Let's encourage people to have better community. Let's get rid of GMO foods. Let's get rid of glyphosate. That would be, a reflection of authorities that actually care about people's health that but they don't which just yeah. is confirmation that they don't care about people's health which is a very sad thing to say now that's not blanket statement there are of course people who dedicate years at medical school who generally care about like helping people they go into a system with all the best intentions of like i want to be a doctor or a nurse because i want to help but the system itself is broken. It's dysfunctional. It's great, as I said, for acute situations. I'll be the first to say, hey, you got hit on your motorbike, go to the ER. They're, they're geniuses that will save your life. But if you're dealing with these everyday mundane things like acid reflux or heartburn, constipation, restless leg syndrome, a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, and they're just pumping SSRIs on people, which creates suicidal ideations. And, you know, that's, that is not a service based in healthcare. It's just not. Right. And it's not even making it wrong. It's just an objective analysis, right? So I think the opportunity and why I'm not worried about what, what, what this virus might do is because I see the opportunity to let's get intelligent, let's get authentic, let's get committed to what it means to really be a healthy society. And that currently isn't the focus. So that's a great opportunity. Is it easy? You know, probably not because there's a lot of resistance, <laughs> right. you know, but there's, there's for every billion dollars that a company makes from selling drugs, I promise you there's way more if you became advocates for health because people want that. Like if you actually became somebody committed, which is what I'm doing to helping people create vital lifestyles, people would pay way more for that than like having to go to the local pharmacy and uh, put more drugs in their system. So I think it's an opportunity for there to be a great pivot, you know, for people to wake up and go, oh, hi, hang on a minute. There is a much bigger marketplace to promote health than manage disease. Yeah. 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 It's like people, people also create the demand to a certain extent. So if people demand vaccines yeah. and medications, they're like, they want the quick fix. Then the companies, of course, are going to try to create that. But uh, again, if the mindset and uh, the, um, the demand changes that the people want to you know healthy lifestyle uh, like prevent preventative uh, healthcare so to say then also the uh, companies would be forced to change with that so to say so yeah, yeah we, people just have to be smarter again uh, as individuals and to create change uh, from your own yeah. uh, individual perspective yeah and that's why i think it's beautiful in this day and age through social media and like podcasts like yours people are getting educated i've learned a lot from you i've learned a lot from you know, other health optimization specialists that have inspired me. And I'm already sort of at the cutting edge of what it means to be healthy, right? So there's, there's just a wealth of information out there. Now, a lot of it sadly gets suppressed and people are getting censored, you know, which is just, you know, that is corruption, where these big companies don't want people to know about the hydroxychloroquines or, you know, vitamin D or getting outside in the sun, because that is in a juxtaposition and in complete conflict with their their mandates and their policies of trying to push drugs, which is that's sad, you know, when you start to interfere with the uh, expression of, of free free speech. 
Um, but there is still nonetheless so much information out there where people can actually start to become um, their own source of wellness. They can go, wow, I didn't realize that if I don't eat this toxic meat, you know, that uh, I actually stand a better chance right. of having some vitality. If I don't buy produce that isn't organic, I stand a good chance of putting, you know, chemicals in my body, which are going to interrupt my endocrine system and my hormonal imbalances, you know, like that's, wow, that's, that's good to know. So maybe they just start to, you know, move in a direction where maybe they can't fully afford totally organic, but they at least remove some of the worst culprits and um, they start to feel better. When they feel better, they have greater productivity. When they have greater productivity, they generate more resources. They have more resources. They can take better care of themselves, right? So it becomes, yeah. instead of a vicious cycle, we go to a virtuous cycle. So it mm. sort of spirals upwards. So yeah, um, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done, but I still, <laughs> I still say, uh, you know, we're here, we might as well make it a much better planet for everybody. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good a note to start wrapping up as well. And like before sure. I ask, ask my last question, uh, what's this, uh, or where can, where can uh, people learn more about uh, you and your work? Um, two places, like the course, if people want to look into that is just on my website, peterkrohn.com. So just my name. And then uh, social media, uh, Instagram, Peter Krohn official. We do have a Facebook. I'm not personally very active on that, but I know some people prefer that. I think it's just Peter Crone, the mind architect. But yeah, Instagram and my website are the best places to uh, stay up to date with whatever I'm throwing out there to try and help people be uh, you know, happier, more free, more vital human beings, if you're into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. We're going to put all the links in the show notes. And um, my last question is, uh, last time we talked, I asked, like, what's this one piece of advice you wish you adopted sooner? But I'm going to ask this time, like, what's this one piece of advice or habit you, uh, you wish you adopted before, let's say, 2020? Uh, moving out of America. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. I got to have a little bit of humor with my work. Um, gosh, yeah, sleep was the answer last time. But prior to 2020, um, as a habit, I don't know. I feel very, you know, I feel very blessed with the habits that I have. So it really probably would be something to do with geography. Like I'm literally right now uh, looking at where I want to live. And it's kind of an exciting proposition. I've always seen myself in the mountains somewhere. So um, of course, I wouldn't have been inspired to think about that prior. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe be a little bit more dedicated with breath work, mm. you know, because I do that and I think it, but make it an act. Actually, I'll take that back. Let's, let's, let's look at flexibility. That's something that I know I could improve on. Just general mobility. Like I'm strong, mm. I'm fast, I'm in great shape, I'm fit. But um, something that, you know, I notice like whether you do it through yoga or any other discipline that helps to improve flexibility, that's something that I'm actually now incorporating more. So if I'd started back then, I'd, you know, be like a handy bendy gandhi kind of yeah. yogi. Type. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good uh, tip, and yeah, it does help with uh, does help with like just general uh, functionality, sort of say, so you don't get like rigid and uh, stiff. Even you know, like later years, people tend to really become very like stiff and uh, yeah, not, not be able to let's say pick up their uh, child or pick up a book uh, from the ground. Yeah, or even get off the ground. I I think. Um, it's a beautiful color, uh, cor coloration. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a beautiful, it, it correlates beautifully with the flexibility of mind, right? Like when people become old, they tend to become not only rigid of body, but also rigid of mind. And we start to see this in people's stubbornness. Mm. And so I think to maintain the flexibility of youth is also to maintain the childlike nature of mind. And uh, so I love that uh, sort of synchronicity of flexible in mind, flexible in body. Exactly. <laughs> That's perfect uh, to end the podcast. So it was great talking yeah. with you. Great to catch up. And yeah, great hopefully, hope, yeah, hopefully we can see each other in person again, maybe next year. Yes, if we are allowed on a plane without yeah. putting uh, some toxic chemicals in our body. <laughs> Otherwise, <Yeah. laughs> I'm not moving anywhere. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I send much love to your audience and uh, hopefully this is inspiring people to uh, take better care of themselves, each other and the planet as a whole. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks for coming. All right, bud. All right, that's it for this episode. If you want to support us, then leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can also share it with a friend. If you want to learn more about the topics that we discussed in this episode, then check out my new book, Stronger by Stress. But on that, thanks for listening to this episode. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.